it requires being willing to do things that are inherently uncomfortable. Everything from exercise, being willing, willing to be hungry sometimes, being willing to like not make that impulse purchase that you think is gonna like solve all your problems because it's, it's not. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. Ryan Nicodemus is in Montana, and TK Coleman is sick today. Get well soon, TK. But don't worry, we've got the most beautiful voice in America with us. Aww. Malabama's here. Hi, everybody. We've got the rest of our team in the studio as well. Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we're joined by Michael Easter, author of The Comfort Crisis and the new book, Scarcity Brain. Together, we talk to a caller who has a question about the discomfort of letting go. And then another listener has a question about dealing with boredom. Then we've got our lightning round segment and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 422, where we answer five times the questions, and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash the minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement-free because advertisements suck. Let's start with our callers. If you've got a question or a comment for our show, give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. By the way, we're looking for more listener tips right now. Do you have a minimalist tip, a decluttering tip, or a tip for any of the people who call into this podcast and they're looking for your insights? Your insights are obviously different from mine and different from Ryan's, different from TK's. Do you have an insight for one of our listeners? Feel free to call in or send a voice memo right there from your phone. Try to keep it under a couple minutes. Podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Rachel in Hawaii. Hi, my name is Rachel and I live in Lahaina. And I've been listening to you and living a minimalist lifestyle because of you since at least 2015. I'm a Maui wildfire survivor and have been reduced to what I would call an even below the line minimalist, perhaps red line minimalist now since I have absolutely nothing. I had redefined my life since 2015 to a beautiful, simple way of living in Maui and loving all the freedoms of simplicity. After my home burned to the ground, I'm now in such a new journey in my life and have questions for my future that I'm hoping you may be able to shed light on because I'm overwhelmed with nothing, which I call ultimate minimalism, and also thinking my situation may help others who may still be in the early stages of embracing being a minimalist. We can let go of things and stuff, but when everything is gone and we are starting from scratch, who are we? What defines us? Why do we feel so vulnerable to everything and everyone? I am honestly struggling at the age of 59 years old of what should I do? Before the fire, I had only a few physical, sentimental items in my home, which I cherish daily. And the rest of my lifetime items that I let go were held deeply in my heart. And I was okay with that balance. But with now everything being gone, I feel lost like a sail floundering in the wind and so vulnerable. I'm reaching out as just an individual, but no, there are so many others in Lahaina with the same struggle and many others who may be having a harder time letting go of their life memories now gone forever because of the fire. I would love to hear from you and hope to get some help. Aloha, Rachel. Rachel, first off, I'm really sorry to hear what you've had to go through. Obviously, a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, a lot of stress. Talked about being vulnerable and actually feeling lost. And Michael, that's why I wanted to talk to you about her question today, because you've written two books that I think they they correspond really well with the question here. Because when we, when everything is stripped away from us and we didn't ask for that, not only do we feel an intense amount of discomfort in our lives, we've lost our comfort items, the things that make us feel comfortable. And there's nothing inherently wrong with feeling comfortable. But then also we experience this tremendous level of scarcity or 
perceived scarcity. Do you have any insights for Rachel? Yeah, I mean, terrible story. Like, very sorry to hear that. Um, Here's what I'll say. What I was thinking about when she was talking is that um, when I was reporting the comfort crisis, I talked to this guy whose name is Mark Seary, and he is a researcher at one of the New York State universities, psychologist. And, you know, there's that saying, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. (laughs) And he wonders, okay, like we all have these quips, right? And they maybe make sense intuitively, but are they backed by evidence? So what this guy ends up doing is he he conducts this massive survey of thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans. And he basically asks them how many traumas they've had in their life, like big catastrophic, catastrophic events like we're talking about right here. And he gets the number of them. And then he follows up. He asks them, like, are you unemployed? What does your health look like? How is your mental health? How often do you visit the doctor? How many prescriptions do you take? All these different things. And uh, what he finds is actually very surprising. He finds that on one hand, people who have experienced big trauma after big trauma after big trauma, they don't have great mental health. Their physical health isn't great. But on the other hand, and this is where it gets really interesting, is that people who have no big traumas and big hardships in their life, they have equally poor rates of mental health. Equally poor. So literally, not facing any big problems in your life is as bad as facing problem after problem after problem. What he finds is that there's actually a sweet spot to problems, okay? So you need a certain number of problems and traumas in your life because it acts as a great teacher. It teaches you what to do the next time you face them and you become more resilient over time. Of course, if they're one after the other after the other, you can't recover, you can't learn. But one of the big arguments that I make in the comfort crisis is that... um, as the world has gotten more and more comfortable and safer, um, these repeated trauma after trauma after trauma are rarer in everyday life. And so oftentimes when we have these big events, um, we need to realize that although they are exceedingly tough and challenging in the short term, I'm not discounting that in any way, but we often learn from them and we often look back and say, that was a great teacher and we become uh, more resilient. Our health improves, all these different markers of what we want a human being uh, to have and how we want to live our life, they all go up. And why do you think that is? Is it Does it have something to do with we begin to question everything in our lives? I know with me, two events happened to me sort of back to back. It was like almost like getting in two car crashes. And that's what started this whole minimalist journey for me. It was my mom died, my marriage ended both in the same month. And from there, things began unraveling. My career unraveled, the house that I live in lived in unraveled, the amount of debt that I had accumulated unraveled. I realized that Oh, there were there were a whole lot more problems here, and maybe contextually, at least in in my life, there were a lot of micro traumas in a way that were mostly self induced, not entirely. But then these other outside events then shone a light on what was going on inside me. What have you seen through your research? Yeah, I mean, uh, to a certain extent, um, how do you learn to swim? It's, you get thrown into the deep end, right? We usually don't um, grow and learn when things are perfect. Usually takes, you know, maybe it's things boiling under the surface until they're, you know, eventually the pressure gets so big from the boiling that it just something snaps and we get thrown out into the deep end. But I do think that um, humans are good swimmers. I think that many of us can figure it out, especially if we know that, usually we're going to learn and grow from a situation in the long term. So part of my work really is I'm a, I'm a journalist and a lot of that is traveling to um, kind of austere places, um, going into some interesting places and doing some uh, things that people might consider extreme. And as part of this work, uh, I've developed this motto and it's no problem, no story. All right, so anytime I go into an interesting place on a you know investigative story as part of my books, When things go perfectly and everything lines up as it should, it's usually not a good story. It's boring. It's boring. No news is good news. It's so boring. It's when things go off the rails, when complications get inserted, and I have to figure out, okay, how am I going to solve this? How am I going to just try and get this thing back on the rails? is when I get a great story out of it. And when I learn something about myself, because as you're like wrestling with that train to get it back on on the rails you get a lot stronger and you learn something about yourself and how to navigate the future uh, when things come up in the future. It's almost like God or nature or the universe hands us these problems that are just outside of our comfort zone or sometimes way outside of our perceived comfort zone so that we can begin to problem solve in ways that actually help us thrive. You talked about 
traveling to austere environments. And for me, one that I often think about, and this is counterintuitive, so I was hoping to ask you about it, is when I think of like Buddhist monks that live in you know, a temple somewhere in the Himalayas or what I've what I see through them is not necessarily a lot of hardship because of maybe the micro hardships or the boredom that they've injected into their own lives. Do you have any insights on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, they learn from that. So, as in the comfort crisis, um, I traveled to Bhutan. Now, Bhutan is really interesting because, as far as uh, GDP goes, it is way down the list of countries. I mean, it's like one sixty something out of one hundred and eighty. There's not a Starbucks, McDonald's, Burger King in the country. There's not even a stoplight in the entire freaking country. Wow. Wow. So they don't have all these comforts and advancements that we have. Um, But when Japanese researchers do extensive studies on happiness, they find that Bhutan consistently ranks in the top 20 happiest countries. And a lot of that is um, because of some of the hardships that they face. For example, they spend a lot more time in nature. They also, uh, relevant to this show, they don't have debt. So they don't have medical debt because that's all taken care of. They all tend to own their land. Um, They also are cognizant of the fact that uh, we're all going to die. So death is sort of woven into the country. So people are told to think about their death at least once a day. Now, that is an uncomfortable thing to do, right? That is the most uncomfortable thought that a human being could have. But by going through that, you find that people start to get um, happier because it makes you um, make different decisions, right? If you realize that the ride's going to end, you're going to ride the ride differently. So when I was there, I uh, traveled to meet this guy who's a Kempo. His name is Kempo Punchotashi. And you can think about a Kempo as being kind of like a cardinal, but in Buddhism. And he lives up on this uh, mountain. And we have to take this like dirt road, just four by four road. And we're in a smart car. So it's like, the, you know, the greatest adventure ever. The driver's just like, <laughs> I like, had to buy the guy a new bumper. Um, <laughs> but so I get up there and it's also, I mean, it's also something like it's out of a movie, right? I get up to this shack on the side of a cliff and this woman takes me through this like sort of cleansing ritual. I walk into the house, the first room, there's literally nothing in it. Right, there's no running water in this place. I walk into the second room. It's this kitchen with a cooktop, um, bucket system for water, a couple tools. And I'm just like, dude, like, all right, let's try door number three. So it's like this silk orange drape. And I like peel back the drape and I look and there's this big statue of the Buddha sitting there with like incense. And there's a window and there's light coming through the window, catching the smoke. And, you know, my head is turning and then I just see this face. And the Kempo is sitting in the lotus position on a me- meditation platform. And he's in, he's got the orange robes. He's got the beads. He's got the shaved head. And he just turns his head slowly and just goes, welcome. <laughs> I hear you want to talk about death. <laughs> just like, oh, no. like, oh, holy hell. Um, so I sit down there and I talk about death with him. And uh, after about an hour, he he puts it like this. He goes, I want you to... Uh, picture that you are walking on a trail. And at the end of this trail is a cliff. He goes, okay, the catch is that the cliff is death. He goes, and guess what? Right now, you are walking on that trail. We're walking on it right now. And he looks at me and he goes, don't you want to know that there's a cliff? Because once you know that there's a cliff and you realize that, you're going to walk the trail differently. Right? You're going to walk it slower you're going to maybe have different conversations with the people you're walking it with. You're going to stop and smell the freaking flowers on the side of the trail. So once you start to realize that um, you're going to die eventually, you walk the trail a little differently. And that changes your behavior and makes people happier in the long run. Can we talk to, about scarcity with respect to this question? Because what happens is sometimes we can put ourselves in these austere situations where we've self-imposed our own scarcity, right? Uh, But other times, like with Rachel, everything was stripped away. And so there's that feeling of vulnerability and lost and like, I don't have enough. And maybe in this scenario, she actually doesn't have enough, but you also begin to realize what enough is is, and it's probably a lot different from your perception of enough, or certainly from the cultural or societal mm, prescription of more, more, more is the only way to get to enough. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that in reporting the scarcity brain, I mean, 
humans are, we're really wired to crave more, more of what helps us survive. So everything from food to stuff to information to the number of people we could influence, all these different things. They used to keep us alive in the past, right? That drive kept us alive. And so when we believe that resources are scarce, our natural reaction is to freak out. <laughs> it's to clamor for more because that, that drive kept us alive for all of time. And so we still have that DNA. So I think in this case of um, Rachel, I mean, I think you can make a pretty strong argument that like she probably maybe doesn't have enough. Um, but I also think that's relatively rare in modern society where I think most people most of the time today um, do have enough to survive and get by. Um, I think one of the things that I heard when she was talking is that a lot of the items that she lost had sentimental value. That's another thing that makes uh, humans really interesting is that we can tell stories right? We can place a value on an item based on a story. It was owned by this person who meant something to me and then transfer that relate the meaning we have behind that relationship onto a leftover item. Now, that's a very powerful thing. And I always grapple with that personally, with items in my own life that have been handed down for me, right? It's like, I'm not going to throw away everything that I don't want that say my grandfather left me. But at the same time, I also have to put some boundaries there. Because if everything I'm like, I'm going to have all this guy's stuff. <laughs> right? So I have to be like, okay, at what point is this um, improving the sort of story I have in my head about the relationship and improving my life? And at what point uh, is it maybe hindering me? I'm clinging to this stuff. And it's maybe only weighing me down. Yeah. And I think what happens in a scenario like Rachel's, and I've heard the same story more than a hundred times as the minimalist, especially when we go out on tours and we're talking to people face to face. I lost everything. My house burned down. There was a flood. There was a fire. There was some sort of mold infestation. Everything I owned was in my car and my car got stolen. I've heard an iteration of this story so many different times. The nuance of that, or at least the lesson a lot of people learn, is that when you let go of everything, everything remains. Like everything else that was important to you, that is truly important to you, your life is the thing that remains. And yes, some of our material possessions can augment our experience of life. And I'm not against material things. In fact, as a minimalist, I get far more value from the few things I own than if I were to water them down with hundreds of thousands of trinkets that got in the way, with clutter, basically, right? And so what's interesting about the sweet spot, I think quite often for many people, it's way lower than what you thought it was. You thought happiness was out there, and then you meet someone with nothing who is eminently happy. I'm sure with your, well, with your travels, you've come across a lot of those people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that having, look, like having what you need to survive, I think increases happiness. But then the question is like, what do you actually need to survive? And I will say that when you look at the grand scheme of time, that goalpost moves farther to more every single year, right? So people think that um, necessity is the mother of invention. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> we invent stuff and then we believe we absolutely need it to survive. Mm. So think about like GPS, think about your cell phone, think about your AirPods. There is so much stuff that determines the course of our daily life that we don't actually need to survive. And yet we think we need, right? And once you start adding that stuff up, you end up uh, with a house similar to mine with, with too much crap in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also you end up with a narrative that says, not only do I like these things or I enjoy them, but I need them. And the things we thought were going to bring us pleasure often give us pain. And I think that's the sort of dilemma that you're talking about in the comfort crisis is when we, when, well, when we nerf wrap our entire lives and become perfectly comfortable, that is a place that actually increases our pain. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so the comfort crisis, it really looks at how, as the world has become more comfortable, we've lost a lot of the things that keep us healthy, that make us human. So if you think about your day-to-day -day life and how people live day-to-day -day life today, the things that most determine the course of your day, everything from um, the houses we live in, climate control, the beds we sleep in, um, how we get from point A to point B, our food system, how we spend our attention, all these things are new in the grand scheme of time and space, they're less than 100 years old and they're all designed to make your life easier and more comfortable. And that has affected us. 
because, you know, humans are wired to do the next most comfortable, easiest thing. And for all of time, that served us, kept us alive. And that's because we involved in environments that were super uncomfortable, that were very hard to live in, right? It was always too cold. You always had to put in effort for anything. Um, there were long periods of doing nothing, i.e. boredom. You had to learn what to do with boredom. And now we just have an antidote for all of those things. And so, I mean, at a practical level, just to throw in some stats because people like stats. So <laughs> 93% of uh, our time we spend indoors, right? We used to spend all of our lives outside. We evolved in outdoor environments. And still today, um, that seems to be where people's mental health is best. Yet we now are 93% of our time in walls, right? Um, think about our food system. A third of food gets thrown out. 80% of eating is driven by reasons other than true comf than true hunger. Right? So most of the time, it's because it's a certain time on the clock. It's because, I don't know, I'm stressed. It's because like, oh, I'm watching this show and I always eat popcorn when I watch the show, whatever it might be. Uh, exercise. I mean, the average person takes like 4,000 steps a day. Uh, people in the past were about 14 times more active than we are today. 14? 14. Wow. Because it's not just the steps. Okay, so... What do you do if you don't have a chair? Well, you have to, you squat. That's how you hang out. Okay, well, that like, that activates muscle. Uh, every single thing, I mean, the act of getting food, hunting and gathering is literally walking and running across rough, untamed landscapes to get calories, to not die. I mean, that's what we did every single day. We basically had a couple jobs. It was like, have some kids and don't die. And that was it. And that's, <laughs> and that was hard to accomplish. Right? And now we've just engineered the world in such a way um, where we don't have to do any of that, which great problem to have in the grand scheme of time and space. I'm not, I wouldn't change anything about today, but I do think that living well today, it requires being willing to do things that are inherently uncomfortable. Everything from exercise, being willing, willing to be hungry sometimes, being willing to like not make that impulse purchase that you think is going to like solve all your problems because it's, it's not mm -hmm. um, and on and on and on. Let's move on to some social media questions, Malabama. I know we got a few here. This one is from Doug on Instagram. It seems to me that we humans always want things easier, supposedly because we want more time. So almost every invention is supposed to make things easier and give us more free time. But why can't we just live in the moment and embrace the boredom and tedium that come with doing some things? This is a weird sort of thing that I think we all experience because then you hear people prescribe living in the moment. And good luck like telling, all right, Maller, you know what? You should just go live in the moment. You should be more present. And on one level, I understand what they mean by that. They are talking about, well, quite often we're living in the past. We're looking in this sort of rear view of our mind and we're beating ourselves up for things that happened in the past. I'm great at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, I will beat myself up for something that hasn't even happened yet. I'm punishing myself I'll often say to worry is to pray for something bad to happen in the future. And that's not a judgment so much as it is me understanding that I'm often accidentally being overly concerned about something that is outside of my control. One thing that I've learned recently, though, and this one's really difficult, Michael, because we are so heavily stimulated. We've got that that, that slot machine in our pocket now. We have infinite songs, infinite distractions, infinite access to infinite information. It's impossible to be bored. But boredom can be a prize more than it is a punishment. And as soon as I realized that, like boredom was something for me to, to look at, to hold on to, not to punish myself with, but to recognize that it's actually okay. Yeah. So as, as part of the comfort crisis, I spent uh, about a month up in the Arctic and um, I didn't have my cell phone. I didn't have magazines. I didn't have books. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have a TV. I didn't have an iPad, on and on and on, right? And so a lot of it was just spent sitting around with nothing to do. And I found myself bored again, right? So then it's like, okay, well, what did I do with my boredom? At one point, we were reading the uh, nutrition labels on our energy bars, right? So Cliff, <laughs> Cliff Bar has 250 calories, 6 grams of fat, 49 carbs, 10 grams of protein, right? I can remember <laughs> things like that now. Uh, we read the tags on our jackets. My jacket was made by a guy named Hong in America, now, after that, I came up with Christmas lists for everyone I know. 
for the next like 10 years. <laughs> and then I wrote some of my book. <laughs> so I told you that to basically tell you this. And that's that uh, the way that I spent my time, my free time up there was way different than I would have at home, right? If I get bored today, what do I do? I immediately pull out my cell phone or I turn on TV. So the average American today spends more than 13 hours a day engaged with digital media. So that's from cell phones, that's from TVs, that's from computers, that's from iPads, it's from all this stuff. Um, but boredom in this context can actually be a good thing. So if you think about what boredom is, like what is it, why the hell do humans actually get bored in the first place? Boredom is an evolutionary discomfort that basically tells us whatever you're doing with your time right now, the return on your time invested has worn thin. So you need to go do something else. Okay, so I want you to picture that we are all sitting and we are hunting, say, and we need this food or else we're gonna, we're gonna starve to death and die, right? And we're sitting and we're waiting and no animals are coming through. Well, boredom would kick on and it would basically tell us, go do something else. Now in the past, that something else was often more productive, right? We would go, okay, well, we gotta go pick potatoes or we gotta go pick apples or whatever it might be so we don't die. Today, when we feel that discomfort of boredom, it effectively gets hijacked by these hyper-stimulating devices that we're surrounded in. Um, but I think that boredom has upsides, and this is demonstrated in various studies. So, for example, um, one great study found that having time when you're bored can increase creativity. So this is one of the reasons why people get their best ideas in the shower is that like your your time your brain has this time to sort of mind wander and mind wandering seems to allow your brain to go to interesting places and good ideas come out of the ether. Uh, it's also associated with less stress and more productivity in a couple studies. And then I think more importantly, and to kind of bring it back to this idea of being present, it's you know there's this quote from William James and he basically says that at the end of your life. Your life is effectively a culmination of what you were aware of, what you paid attention to. So today we pay attention to 13 hours of digital media on average. And I'm not saying that all of that is bad. Of course it's not. But I am saying what tends to happen is we feel this ancient di discomfort of boredom and we automatically go for the easiest thing. And I think that sometimes it's good to just sit with it and not do the easy thing and see where that takes you. You talked about, and this is counterintuitive to me, it's the first time I've heard that boredom can lead to less stress. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because I think at first we actually feel a pang of more anxiety, which then leads to more stress. But what you're saying it sounds like is on the other side of that anxiety could be stress relief. Yeah. Well, I think a big story of improving your life today, generally, like big picture, is that you often have to go through short-term discomfort to get a long-term benefit. And that applies to most um, practices we do that we consider wellness practices today. Uh, but to answer your question, so when you are focused on the outside world, um, having a conversation, looking at a screen, whatever it might be, uh, your brain is actually working rather hard. It's a, effectively a work state for your brain. Now, when you uh, get bored, the first thing that you do is you start to mind wander, right? You totally go inward. And this is more like a rest state for your brain. It fires on what's called the default mode network. And so this allows your brain some sort of uh, downtime, rest and relax time. So when you think about the 13 hours a day we spend focused outwardly, that's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of like the lifting phase and none of the, the resting phase. Mm. And so getting a little bit more boredom, spending time inward seems to give us more rest period and that's associated with less stress. And the other thing is that, I mean, depending on who you are, this obviously doesn't apply to everyone, but I know uh, a lot of my family members is that when they are online, it's like, well, what are you looking at? It's like, I'm on Twitter getting really, really mad about politics, or I'm down some conspiracy rabbit hole just getting fired up about some nonsensical thing, All right? So if you are, say, using your phone to read uh, classics to, I think this show is a great example of something that's giving people positive benefits. Um, if you're using it for positive things, I don't see a big problem in that. I mean, 13 hours, like maybe we could like dial that down a bit. <laughs> um, but it's also like, what are you using it for? And I think that people often default to like, I'm just going to go on social and social often incentivizes uh, outrage, unfortunately. It does. And in fact, I think what happens is we go to the device because it's such a multi-purpose tool. We go to the device to do one thing and end up getting distracted into another thing. And either A, we 
completely forget about the original task. Oh, I was going to go text my mother about something with her upcoming trip. Or we just completely forget about, well, we get so buried in TikTok or whatever the, the enticing digital platform is at the time that we get worked up and angry. And then we take that anger, that frustration into the task that we originally went there for in the first place. And not only did I waste 15, 25, 45 minutes scrolling, but I, um, I, I left that not as a better version of myself, but as a more frustrated version of myself. I can 1000% before we move on, identify with, I went to the phone to do this one thing and then I just got sucked in and was, and then went and sat down and was like, oh my God, I got up in the first place to do that one thing that I hadn't done. I mean, I think it goes back to that loop that I was telling you about. I mean, that just captures the attention of uh, humans, rats, pigeons, all animals get attracted by um, opportunity to get something of value, unpredictable rewards. You don't know what it's going to be. You don't know when you're going to get it. And then the ability to just keep repeating the behavior. And that is what a lot of these apps work on. It's interesting. You're making me think about boredom as a luxury rather than a thing to avoid. And I'm not saying prescriptively go out there and now find the boredom in your life. But ultimately, that's what Doug is talking about here. Why can't we just live in the moment and embrace boredom and tedium that comes with doing some things or more accurately with not doing things? That is really the problem that we have is I'm not doing anything. My hands are idle. And now all of a sudden it gets kind of ugly up here. I don't know if you ever spent time in a sensory deprivation tank. Yeah. And what you realize is that as soon as you turn down all of the senses, there's one sense that gets turned way up and it's the mind. And you forget how loud it is up here when you've turned everything else down. But when I think about boredom as a luxury, what do I think about? Oh, wow. Maybe this is kind of nice because when we go do luxurious things. We go to a spa treatment for the day. You spend all this money on a spa treatment. It's a luxury spa. Why am I doing that? Oh, because I have so much stress. I need to de-stress. Well, what if there was more boredom in my life? Maybe it would lead to less stress. Yeah. I mean, if you want to get pers prescriptive, one thing that I talk about in the comfort crisis is just go for a walk outside for like 20 minutes and just don't bring your phone because you're inevitably going to get bored. Um, you're also going to get some exposure to the outdoors. So we know that spending time in nature is inherently good for people and their mental health. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Your mind's going to wander, probably going to come up with some interesting ideas. I think it's a really easy practice to fold into your life. And rarely is that going to harm anyone. If you just leave the phone at home. I've always often had people, because I've done these experiments where I get rid of the phone for like 60 days at a time. And you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about your friends. You learn a lot about your habits. You learn a lot about your default to panic when it's not there and you're reaching for the device. But also, sometimes people say, well, what if there is an actual, what if I have an emergency? Okay, you might have an emergency, but I'm not the person to call if you have an emergency. Like dial 911. I know what you're saying. I understand the spirit of this, but it's almost like we've turned everything into an emergency. Everything that is an emergency to someone else now has to become urgent to me, whether it is my ex or Twitter responses or the DMs on Instagram or whatever it is. Now I'm seeking out emergencies not even realizing that I'm looking for what is my next emergency. No wonder there's no time for boredom. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, if you're older than, say, 15, it's like you lived past not having a phone at some point. Like the emergencies didn't kill you 15 years ago and before that. So, like, why would they kill you today? Alabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, and Threads. We are at The Minimalists on all of those platforms. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your questions with a short shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And by the way, if you want those minimal maxims delivered straight to your inbox every Monday, 
in your email address over at theminimalists.email. You can get on our newsletter over there. We'll never send you spam or junk or advertisements, but we will start your week off with some show notes and some minimal maxims and much, much more of less. It looks like today's question is from Blue Collar Papa. If the key to work-life balance is scheduling time for rest, how can we do this when our work schedule is constantly changing? Now, before you hear my pithy answer, and by the way, I've got a pithy answer from TK as well. Let's listen to this clip about work-life balance. We noticed your productivity level is down by 30% over the last two months. We just wanted to check in, see how everything's going, uh, everything good at home, all's good. Oh, everything's fine. I'm just not working as hard. <laughs> okay, um, why is that? Well, I don't feel like it. <laughs> you don't want to give it your all? No, I'm good. Can I ask why? I work too hard, and I want to live more. Right. Uh, look, to be honest, this might affect your next promotion cycle. Yeah, it's fine. You don't want to get promoted? No. I'm happy where I'm at. I don't want to alarm you here, but from a career perspective, uh, you're missing out on potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in the future. I'm at a comfortable place in life by every standard in the world, except for when I look at people with more money than me. Like, where does this infinite growth go? Uh, when am I going to look around and see that I'm not really suffering, except for when I think about what I'm missing out on? Mm. Well, I don't, it doesn't, with all due respect, we do expect 100% out of our employees. Well, sir, with no due respect, literally nothing in nature operates at 100%, 100% of the time. Why should I expect myself to? Oh, my stars. Isn't that good, Alabama? I need that on my bathroom mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Yet nothing operates at 100% all of the time. And I think that's sort of the toxic bit about hustle culture or extreme, any extreme work culture. And I say this not from a point of judgment, but a point of extreme identification. A few things happen to me. One is I'm a total completionist, so I like to get things done. I'm also a people pleaser, and so I want to impress people, especially the bosses that I've worked for in the past. I wanted them to feel good about me and also want to please the customers, and so I'd work, go out of my way to work really, really hard to please them. And it's not that, there's nothing wrong with hard work, but the expectation of give it your all 100% of the time, this is what happens, and I think it creates a problem with work-life balance. Here's my pithy answer for you. Work-life balance presumes that one's work is separate from one's life. Well, what do I mean by that? We often talk about work-life balance as though I've got my work over here, and then everything else that is outside of work must be my life. Well, how miserable is that? Because it presupposes now I need to get all of my meaning from my work. I need to feel fulfilled here. But then I also need to create enough time to live my life because my life must be separate from my work. I don't like work-life balance so much as I like work-life integration. And I try to do a good job with this with our team here. I often fail with it because I will heap my own desire to work hard onto others, but I step back and I make sure that we have created an environment that A, hopefully the work is compelling enough and what we're doing is compelling enough that you want to do it. But I also recognize that Danny doesn't want to edit videos 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? And so how can we set up an environment here so that we recognize that and respect that, yes, Danny's work, part of his work involves doing these things. Part of his life involves that work, but this isn't his life. It's a, a deep understanding that this is a part of his life. And it gets out of balance when we expect it to be more than what it needs to be. And so we get back to Blue Collar Papa's question here. And what Blue Collar Papa is asking, can I just call you Papa? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actually, blue. Blue works better, right? Blue works better. All right, blue. Um, 
Here's here's what I think about when I think about work life balance. I didn't have it for my entire twenties. I worked 362 days a year, and because I was so good at working, and I got all of the rewards from that: the promotions, the raises, the paychecks, the pats on the back, the literal trophies, President's Club awards, certificates, and I was respected. Right. What a farce that was. Needing to be respected by everyone also becomes a a kind of prison. Nothing wrong with being respected, but needing that respect is another type of prison. I got really good at work, and I was really, really, really bad at everything else in life. Our last book, Love People Use Things, was really about these seven essential relationships in our lives. And one of those relationships is creativity. Now, we can be creative in our work, but we can be creative in other areas of our lives as well. However, none of those areas were simply work. It's relationships, it's health, it's finances, it's material possessions, it's developing a deep understanding. Life has all of these essential areas. Work is a part of that life. It's not the thing that we need to balance. It is merely something we need to integrate. One thing TK told me, if he was here, here's his minimal maxim. He said, structure isn't a rule, it's a rhythm. And what he's talking about here is when we don't have boundaries or structures in our life, like I didn't in my 20s, it was work is first and everything that demands my attention at work, more of that, more of that, more of that, because I didn't have a structure. And it produced a rhythm in my life that was chaotic. It was like, death metal. I've got this uh, Pandora playlist. Whenever I want to get Ella out of the house, I turn on the Lamb of God death metal playlist. I looked at turning that on this morning. I was like, "Mm, maybe not today. It it is terrifying, but you sort of panic and you want to leave, right? And that was the rhythm of my life. It was so fast paced all the time. And it was too uncomfortable. We were talking about Mike to Michael about that earlier with the comfort crisis is it was traumatically uncomfortable. Yeah. You don't want that. That's the time when we go looking for work-life balance is when this amount of work is displacing all of the things that are important to me. What's the antidote to that? discovering what's actually important to me. And work is something that's important to me. Creating is really something that's important important to me. And I can fit that into my life without needing to fit my life into my work. Work Work-life balance is worthless when you're balancing the wrong things. I don't mean morally wrong things. I just simply mean that when I'm balancing meetings and I'm balancing promotions and paychecks and consumer purchases, which then force me to work more, what am I actually balancing? Because maybe I'm not balancing what is important to me. All right, right here, right now, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing going on in the life of the minimalists. Just in time for Christmas, our new book, our new old book, Everything That Remains. Uh, We just did this new cover with uh, Grise, this talented Mexican artist. She is super talented. We, 10 years ago, released this book, and it's my favorite thing that we have ever written. Anything, my favorite thing we've ever created. Ryan and I wrote this book called Everything That Remains, and it was really this story about letting go. I'm thinking about that first question that we had from Rachel today. And Everything That Remains was a story of letting go of everything so that we could find everything that was important to us. And it took letting go of some things that, man, it was really uncomfortable to let go of a lot of the things that I let go of. Not just the material possessions, although that's really uncomfortable too. Letting go, especially of sentimental items, really uncomfortable. But it's also uncomfortable to let go of toxic relationships, or maybe just relationships that have expired at this point. What else has expired in my life that is preventing me from going where I want to go? That's what Everything That Remains is about. It's a story of these two suit and tie corporate guys who didn't have any work-life balance, had extreme discomfort, but it wasn't the kind that would heal you. It was the kind of discomfort that would harm you. 
And I had to let go of that discomfort and embrace a new kind of discomfort, a certain type of uncertainty in my life that allowed me to move forward in a way that was more compelling, in a way that was more in line with the life that I wanted to live. The book is called Everything That Remains, and this is the beautiful new cover. This is one of the advanced reader copies here. So it says not for resale on the cover if you're watching the video version here, but we radically simplified the, the cover here. We just took Grise's art. It's this beautiful geometric line drawing of me and Ryan. And we removed all the words from the cover. Big thanks to Professor Sean and Dave over at Spire for helping with the design on this as well. We, um, man, this is my favorite book. And now it is my favorite cover of all of the books that we have written. Everything that remains, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. You can also check out the audio book version. If you like our podcast, you'll like that, or the ebook version, all of which have a brand new cover. Makes for a great stocking stuffer, Alabama. <laughs> or not. You can just buy it for yourself, buy it for a friend, buy it for a loved one, anyone who is struggling with moving on and needing to let go. Alabama, what else you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, my name is Riley. I'm from Santa Rosa, California. I just wanted to comment on uh, a question a lot of people have had about movie collections. Um, people keep talking about having a big DV collection and not sure what to do with it. Um, I just digitized mine. I have a one terabyte hard drive with about 400 movies on it that I can watch anytime. And it takes up less space than uh, two decks of cards. Um, so I think that's a really good option. Um, the only problem I can see with that is if you really like extended features and uh, commentary and stuff like that, obviously that can't really be digitized, but uh, it's, a, it's a really good solution. All right, we'll see y'all on Patreon for the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 422, which includes answers to a bunch more questions. Questions like, my shopping addiction is killing me. How do I stop? Dealing with conflict is incredibly uncomfortable for me. How do I get past this? When are labels like ADHD or OCD helpful? And when are they harmful? What are nine questions that you can ask yourself if you're feeling unfulfilled in life? Also, we've got a private minimalist home tour this week with one of our listeners. It is a minimalist home office with just the right amount of plants and books. Plus a bunch more questions over there on the private podcast and much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, visit patreon.com slash the minimalists or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. By the way, Patreon is now offering free trials. So if you'd like to test drive our private podcast, you can join for seven days for free. Big thanks to Michael Easter for joining us today. His books are called The Comfort Crisis and Scarcity Brain. We'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. And you can sign up for his newsletter and check out his website, eastermichael.com. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. That is our minimal episode for today. If you leave here with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. As TK would say, peace. peace. <laughs> every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it